I am an indie writer. I am a black woman who was once a little black girl enthralled by letters, words, accents, dialects, and storytelling. It was a first, second year teacher who told me at age eight, quote, you're good at this, you should keep writing. I have fought for every scrap of talent to preserve that, to master that, and to push it forth into the world. I have had moments of crippling self-doubt where I abandon platforms that people follow that or with organic, cultivated following that this God-given talent has allowed me to procure and to empower in certain cases and to enable me to pull lifetimes together from people whom I admire, whom are no longer with us and to preserve my portion of culture. The video I put up from the young woman who spoke about the persistent racism, prejudice, bigotry that still persists in traditional publishing, I feel like on some end, y'all don't hear us though. When black writers say that this is what I want to do, this is what I'm aiming to do, and then some, there are people even amongst our own community who will say, who will say that, well, you know, why are you writing? Why do you want to give a portion of your life energy to something people will ignore? Or the thing that I heard that um, forced me to reckon with who was in my circle, this young one who I won't give her name, she's on this app. She said to me, to my face, you know, black people don't read and she's black. And again, the father that I revere, who I get this knack of being a raconteuse from, told his baby girl to her face that you can't eat with an English degree. To have those fears, as it were, actualized is interesting. Because any, because any writer who has tried to be traditionally published has encountered that. We have encountered people who will tell us that they don't understand the language, that it's too black, that can you just change this? Can you just mitigate this? Can you calm this down? Can you change this? And what the CEO of Barnes and Noble said it's not surprising. It's not even disheartening. It's common. Those of us who have, you know, again, chosen not to relinquish our pain for the comfort of white people have encountered people like him. We have encountered people, even again, fellow black people who look you in your face and tell you, why would you want to write? You know, don't nobody read that. Why would you want to do that? Yet. Yeah. Some of those same people will tell you, well, you know, what you think about this and ask and ask for your wisdom. Those same people will say, you know, can you help me with my resume? Those same folk will tell you, oh, you know, I heard about this and I think you should write about it. One of the reasons why I pulled and own the title of Griot in this, in this particular social media space is when I began to do my, do my due diligence about researching is a griot is a historian of sorts through west african tradition griots are taught from father to son father to son or sometimes mother to son or father to daughter or mother to daughter and they keep a culture of a people they keep the history of a people they are teachers they are diplomats and when there are no more griots then the history is written down the thing that I want to 
admonish those of my skin folk and my kin folk as it relates to this thing called writing. Leave us alone about it. This is what I mean. If those of us, if you have a child who has a proclivity to words, speak to that. Don't squash that. There will never be a time where a black writer is not needed. There will never, there will never be a time where that that need that need to capture, to retail, to record, to empower that will that will never cease to exist. But will but what will cease to exist is if you squash that in a child. There are days where I have to make the conscious decision to break that tape that my father that my father gave me. At the same time, I know he gave it to me wanting to put, wanting to shape that intelligence, right? To push it towards something that would make me a whole lot of money. And at the same time, I think it's funny that where I wanted those gifts and talents to go toward medicine, right? And sciences and heal that way. God has allowed me to flip that and still heal this way. The thing that I think is so, that, that needs to be drummed louder to greater, to greater white traditional publishing is we ain't going nowhere. As problematic as self-publishing can be, this is giving black writers an avenue to put our work in the world and own it. Because if you publish something, it's still copyrighted and still attributed to you. You have still done something that not a whole lot of people can do. So the fact that Barnes & Noble wants to have, what was the phrasing he used? Proven bestsellers. We know that's coded language for we don't want no Negroes in the front. Argue with your mama about it. I, I, that's what that means. And yet we have, we as a collective of black writers on this app in the world who, and, so, and those of us who are, have chosen to become div, traditionally published and who have cracked the ceiling of tradition, traditional publishing. That is an, that is an amazing feat. And yet there are still more of us that are coming. Nasoke Sange said that, again, the, the, um, the author of Sassafras, Sassafras, um, and in, I can't think of that, I can't think of that particular short story book, and that's going to bother me now, but she wrote, for colored girls who have considered, who have, whom have considered suicide, but the rainbow was enough. She said that she wrote for the black girls who were coming, who needed something when they arrived. And again, I said to a group of girlfriends that, you know, when, when I catch these, you know, empowering quotes that, you know, come, come through me and I, I try to be diligent about uh, writing those down, that succumb to the talent so completely that fear cannot exist. Meaning that I have chosen that this is what I want to do. This here, I cannot allow what a white editor thinks about my work to control what I'm going to write. Because make no because make no mistake, as I said a couple days ago, the way you control a people is to control a narrative. And you don't need to relinquish your pen to anybody. Relinquish it for what? Give it up for what? For what? And again, as Father Baldwin said, if I just do my work when I am needed, I'll be there. Baldwin has been gone from us almost 50 years, and we are still quoting him. Nikki Giovanni is in is almost 80. Toni Morrison died at 88. Maya died in her 80s. The voices by which women like myself have gathered strength from and pulled from and quote now and quote now as we do Holy Scripture. The voices are leaving. So there has to be someone to replace them. There has to be someone who is bold enough to stand in that, in that gap of society and community and still make our presence known. Give up for what? Give it up. Give my pen up for what? And for who? And why? But no, these those things don't surprise me. They are common. And these are things we have to negotiate. But then when you put, then when you say that racism is pervasive in traditional publishing, then you crazy. Then you're the one with the problem. Andy Thomas got over 200 rejection letters before somebody published The Hate You Give. Not that her writing was bad, I'm, I assure you. It was because some somebody didn't like it. Don't relinquish your pen to anyone.